uh, in this part of the tutorial, we'll talk about formal guarantees for automated mechanism design, and we'll focus on sample complexity guarantees for a distributional or batch learning formalization of the mechanism design. And then actually in the, uh, in the next part of the tutorial, Ellen will tell us even more guarantees for this uh, distributional learning formalization. And then she'll also briefly survey some of the other uh, uh, theoretical results in other models. Okay, so here is we, uh, how we can think about uh, mechanism design as a distributional learning problem. Um, and if you uh, are familiar with machine learning, this will be incredibly natural. Okay, so what we do, we fix the problem that we want to solve, and this could be the problem of uh, pricing one or more uh, items uh, in order to maximize revenue. Okay, and then we also do, we also fix uh, a family of mechanisms uh, for our problem, and this family of mechanisms can either be one that is commonly used in practice, or uh, a family for which we have analytical reasons to believe that they are good for our problem. Right? For example, it could be the family of affine maximizer auctions. Okay. Then what we do, we take a set of samples of buyer values of, for various subsets of the items from the uh, unknown distribution of our buyer values. Okay, and then we use that set of samples in order to come up with a mechanism that we hope has high expected revenue on new random uh, evaluation instances coming from the same distribution. Okay, so let me say this a little bit more slowly. So we fix a problem that we want to solve, and this can be either a, say an auction problem or a pricing problem, uh, and then we fix a family of uh, 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 parameterized, potentially infinite family, family of mechanisms for our problem. Okay, so for example, if we are trying to, uh, if we are thinking about, uh, if we are trying to sell an uh, just an item, uh, we, uh, and uh, if we are trying to just auction an item, for example, we could use a family of uh, second price auctions with reserve prices, and this is a family that Alan described in the first part of the tutorial. Or if you're trying to price multiple items for sale to maximize revenue, you could, for example, use the family of all posted pricing mechanisms. Okay, and notice that these families uh, of mechanisms could actually be uh, very rich, they could be infinite, because we could have one or more um, parameters or knobs that we can tune, right? Or one or more real value parameters or knobs that we can tune. Uh, so for example, for the second price auction of reserve prices, the parameter would be the reserve price here. It's a real, val real value parameter is a reserve price. Or for the um, case of item pricing mechanisms, uh, again, we have multiple real value parameters that we can tune. Okay, so we fix uh, a family of mechanisms for our problem, uh, which, which could be uh, infinite parameterized family of mechanisms. And then we take a set of samples uh, of the buyer's values from the unknown distribution uh, over the buyer's values. Okay, and each of these samples will list, uh, will tell us what the, uh, uh, each of the buyer's values are for each subset of the item. Okay, so for example, for the case of second price auctions of reserve prices, where we only have one item uh, uh, for sale, each sample will just simply tell us uh, the value of each of the buyers for the given item. Right, so this is sample number one, and we have listed here uh, the values for uh, all buyers for the given item, um, right? Uh, and this is first sample, but we have several samples of this type, say capital N sample. Okay, or in the case of uh, posted price mechanisms, where we typically have multiple items for sale, each sample will tell us the value of each buyer for each bundle for sale. Right, and again, for example, this is a first sample, and it, it, here we list the value of the first buyer for all subsets of the items, the value of the second buyer for all subsets of the items, and so on, the buyer for the nth, sorry, the value for the nth buyers for each subset of the item. Okay, this is the first sample, and we have several samples of this form, say capital N samples. Okay? So uh, basically, we have a sample of typical instances uh, coming from the underlying distribution of our uh, buyer's values for various subsets of the items. And now the goal is to use this sample of typical instances in order to come up with a mechanism from our family of mechanisms that we hope has high expected revenue with respect to new random instances coming from the same uh, underlying distribution. And in particular, we want to come up with a mechanism that competes with the best mechanism from this family calligraphic M with respect to the fixed unknown distribution. Okay, and uh, so that's the hope and the goal. And 
a natural approach to try to achieve this goal, which is uh, very natural from a machine learning point of view and also natural uh, from, um, I guess, uh, automated mechanism design point of view. And this is exactly what Thomas described in his second part of the talk. So a natural approach to try to achieve this goal is to just find the mechanism I'm had that does well over the set of typical instances, right? So we're just gonna maybe output a mechanism I'm had that is either optimal or nearly optimal over the set of training instances, training typical instances. Okay, now this makes sense, of course. Um, but of course, the key question is whether this mechanism I'm had that does well over the training set of typical instances will also have high expected revenue. And in particular, will this mechanism I'm had uh, do well on new random instances coming from the same distribution as the training instances. And in particular, one that mechanism I'm had to compete with the best mechanism from our family of mechanisms with respect to this uh, distribution. Okay, so just as an example, uh, for the second price auctions with reserve prices, of course, the mechanism I'm had that we picked uh, 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 will do well on the uh, training set of typical instances because we chosen it that way, but the key question is whether this mechanism I'm had will also do well on new random instances coming from the same distribution that we have now seen yet. Okay, so that's a key question. Now, of course, the answer to this question will probably depend on how many instances we've seen in the training set, right? Because we've seen that if we've seen very, very few instances, there is not much hope to kind of generalize. And as we, see to, as we start to see more and more instances, there is more and more hope to kind of generalize. Okay, and uh, this is basically the key question that we have to think about. This is the sample complexity question. Uh, how many uh, uh, training typical instances do we need to see in the training set in order to guarantee the good performance over the set of typical instances will also translate to good performance on your random instances as well. Okay, this is what I mean by sample complexity. Okay, and uh, uh, there is of course, as you might know, there is a whole field uh, learning theory and empirical processes that studies exactly this question. And um, there are many tools that we can hope to borrow from uh, learning theory and empirical processes in order to address this question. And one specific tool that has been kind of widely used uh, in recent years also in mechanism design is to use the so-called uniform convergence bounds, which are very uh, general type of bounds which roughly quantify uh, how many uh, typical instances do we need to see in the training set so that we can guarantee that with high probability over the draw of the typical instances, we have it uniformly for all the mechanisms in this class of mechanisms, calligraphic HEM, we have it their performance over the training set of typical instances is close, say additively epsilon close to their performance on new uh, random instances. Okay, so these are really strong type of bounds, right? So quantify Again, what they quantify is how many uh, samples of typical instances do we need to see in order to guarantee that uniformly for all that we have probability over the draw of the uh, set of typical instances, we have it uniformly for all mechanisms in our family of mechanisms their performance over the training set of typical instances is close to their performance overall. Okay, now the cool fact is that once you get uniform convergence, once you have enough samples to get uniform convergence, you can immediately guarantee, uh, you can show that you can immediately guarantee that the, uh, the mechanism, uh, mecha any mechanism I'm had that is nearly optimal over the training set of typical instances will also be nearly optimal overall. And in particular, will compete with the best mechanism in this family of calligraphic, in this family of mechanisms calligraphic M with respect to the fixed unknown distribution. Okay, so another way of saying it, once we get uniform convergence, we are in a great shape, right? So. So it's just large enough samples to guarantee generalization and to guarantee what we really are after. Okay, and um, what we know from learning theory is that the number of samples we need to uh, guarantee uniform convergence, very roughly speaking, depends on how complex uh, the class of mechanisms we are optimizing over is. It right, depends on how the intrinsic complexity or intrinsic dimension of this class of mechanisms. And uh, there are many, uh, there are several notions of dimension one could consider here, like Rademacher complexity, pseudo dimension, um, and I'll describe them, I'll describe actually one of them uh, in detail in a bit, 
But for now, before going through details, I just want to say at a high level, uh, what these notions of dimensions are trying to capture, very, very intuitively speaking, they are just trying to capture the ability of the class of mechanisms to feed very complex patterns. Because intuitively speaking, if you can feed many, many crazy complex patterns, you'd expect that you, know, you might be overfitting, and so you need more samples to generalize. Okay? And this is just very, very high level kind of uh, fuzzy intuition. Okay? But I'll be very specific in like a few slides. Okay, and, uh, uh, and actually one, one interesting thing that I want to point out, right, so we know from learning theory, right, exactly, but the number of samples in order to guarantee uniform convergence and good generalization really depends on the, uh, uh, on the complexity, on the dimension, interesting complexity or dimension of the family, family of mechanisms we are optimizing over, and what, basically and once we can characterize the, the no, uh, kind of, uh, these notions of dimensions for the family of mechanisms at hand, we immediately get into a nice sample complexity results of the form that I have here on the slide, right? So for example, this is an example of a sample complexity result. It tells us that the number of samples we see in the training set is of this order, uh, uh, say the pseudo dimension of the family of mechanism over epsilon squared, then that's sufficient to achieve epsilon uniform convergence, which then implies kind of roughly speaking epsilon generalization, okay? So that's uh, great. And I guess by now you might be wondering, uh, especially if, uh, if you uh, are a machine learning uh, friend, you might be wondering, is this just an immediate application of machine learning, right? Is there something interesting from a machine learning theory point of view? Which is something that I'm interested in personally as well. And so it turns out that the answer is yes, you know, trying to understand the notion of dimension for this family of mechanisms that come from uh, mechanism design is non-trivial and it's actually very different from classic machine learning. Why? Because the mechanisms, the family of mechanisms that we often look at, kind of, uh, first of all, they sometimes output combinatorial outputs, right? And moreover, they are modular, you know, like for example, AMA, these are these often maximizer auctions that Thomas talked about. They have modules, you know, they have steps, they have parameters, and you can go, uh, you can get into a situation where if you slightly took the, parame the parameters of the underlying mechanisms, you get totally different outputs. So kind of the corresponding cost functions have sharp discontinuities, and this is a very different structure than what we normally see in machine learning. So it's also very interesting technically uh, to look at uh, these problems and to understand the notions of dimensions for the family of mechanisms that come from mechanism design. Okay, so I find this really cool. Great, and actually uh, uh, before, tell, uh, before talking in detail about some of these notions of dimensions and showing how you can compute them for mechanism design purposes, I just want to mention that kind of uh, sample complexity of mechanism design has become kind of a very hot topic in mechanism design these days. Uh, many different groups have been uh, looking at it. Uh, some of the early work on this topic uh, includes an early paper, uh, almost 15 years old paper, that I had in Fox 2005, joined with Abrin Bloom, Jason Harline, and Nishai Mansour. They're all looking in a very different scenarios com uh, compared to what we're talking about today. For unrestricted, unrestricted supply cases, we're looking at random, uh, analyzing random sampling auctions uh, by using tools from sample complexity, so a bit related. But uh, more recently, uh, many groups have been looking at the exact same setting that we're talking about today. Uh, so for example, Mehri Armori and Andres Medina looked at analyzing the uh, pseudo dimension and random market complexity of second auction, uh, price auctions of reserves. Jamie and team had a series of papers our group had the series of papers and many others, including people in the room, looked at related sample complexity questions. Uh, not all of them are uniform convergence, maybe some of them are more like covering style questions. Okay, so uh, there's been a lot of interest in this area recently. Okay, but for the rest of my uh, part of the tutorial, I'm gonna focus on uniform convergence. And by the way, please feel free to ask any questions and to interrupt me anytime. Any questions? So if there are no questions, I can move on and talk about, I'm gonna give you a, like a five, ten, maybe five to 10 minute tour of VC dimension theory and so the dimension. Uh, so how many of you have seen VC dimension before? Okay, the uh, uh, vast majority, that's perfect. Okay, so as you uh, probably uh, recall, VC dimension is a, a complexity measure that characterizes the intrinsic complexity of uh, the sample complexity of classes of binary valued functions, right? So for example, like linear separators in RD, where you know, we uh, 
where we might have a linear separator that classifies all the points to the right as positive and the points to the left as negative, right? And so again, uh, VC dimension is just a measure of complexity that characterizes sample complexity of binary valued functions. Okay, and what, I, what, I, what is VC dimension more specifically? Well, it's uh, the VC dimension of a class of uh, binary valued functions is the cardinality of the largest set of points that uh, can be labeled in all possible ways by using functions from the class. Okay, so if we have a set S of points, and if I think in bi uh, binary valued function classes, that set S can be labeled in, two to, uh, in uh, two to the power of size of S ways, right? And so that's the maximum number of ways in which you can label that set with binary valued functions. And again, what VC dimension is, the VC dimension of a function class uh, of binary valued functions is just the cardinality of the largest set S that can be labeled in all possible two to the size of S ways with functions from our class. Okay, and when this happens, we're gonna say that this set S is shattered by functions in uh, our function class H. Okay, and if arbitrary large finite set can be shattered by H, then the VC dimension is infinite, but for the tutorial today, let's think about the cases when the VC dimension is finite. Okay, so uh, this is what VC dimension is. It's just the cardinality of the largest set S that can be labeled in all possible ways by functions in uh, H. Uh, and just as a quick example, just uh, you know, in case if there, are, if there is anybody that has never seen this dimension before, let me mention a quick fun example. So you can easily show that the VC dimension of linear separators in R2, so the VC dimension of linear separators uh, uh, on the plane is three. Okay, and why? Because you can show, uh, so in order to show that the VC dimension is three, we need to show two facts. The first fact, we need to show that there exists a set of three points that can be labeled in all possible ways of linear separators. Okay, and that's easy to show. All we have to do is to pick three points that form a triangle like these three points here. And then it's easy to verify that we can label them however we want in all possible eight ways by using linear separators. Right, so for example, if we want to label this point as, say, negative, we can use this, and the other two as positive, we can use this linear separator. Or if we want to label these two points as negative and these point as positive, we can use this linear separator. Okay, and you can show that all eight labelings are achievable. Okay, so that's the first part, and this is typically the easy part to show that the VC dimension is greater than or equal to three. We also need to show that the VC dimension is strictly smaller than four. And how do we show that? To show that, we need to show that no set of four points can be labeled in all possible ways with linear separators. Okay, and that's again easy in this simple example. That's why I picked it. So there are two cases. The first case is where we have four points uh, such that one of them uh, uh, falls inside of the triangle formed by the other, like in this case here. And in this case, it's easy to show that this labeling cannot be achieved. We're trying to label this guy, uh, the, the, the point in the middle, as, posi as say, positive, uh, or maybe as negative, and the other ones as positive. But we cannot achieve this labeling. Why? Because what, for any linear separator that labels all the outside guys as uh, Positive, we could also label this point as positive. Okay, so that's the first simple case where one point uh, falls inside the triangle formed by the others. If this doesn't happen, that means that all the points fall on, form, uh, fall in that, if first case doesn't happen, that means that all the four points are on the boundary. Uh, and, this is, uh, and in this case, we can again show that there is one labeling that we cannot achieve. In particular, we cannot label these two guys as uh, negative and these two guys as positive. Uh, why? Because if we try to do so, then there will be a point at the intersection of these two that will be labeled as po both positive and negative, and this doesn't happen. This cannot happen. Okay, so it's a very simple proof by picture of why this dimension of linear separators in R2 uh, is 3. You can also show that in general the VC dimension of linear separators in Rd is d plus 1. Okay. Okay. Uh, this was just an example, but again, from the point of view of the uh, of the tutorial, what I wanted to remember is a definition, which is the VC dimension of a binary of a class of binary valued functions H is a cardinality of the larger set S that can be labeled in all possible two to the size of S ways by functions in our class. Okay, so that this is what VC dimension is. Okay, and um, for those of you that maybe have seen this dimension, but maybe have not uh, um, 
uh, right, right, but maybe have not seen so much in the context of learning theory. I just want to mention why, you might wonder why this dimension, what, what's the connection between this dimension and generalizability? Why is it connected to sample complexity? Why does it matter? Why do we care about how many points can you label in all possible ways with functions from our class? Why is this relevant uh, for generalization? Okay. And so I'm not going to go through details because, of course, this is like a, these are deep uh, theorems proving that. But I just want to give you some insights of why uh, that's the case. Okay, and so to do so, I'm gonna just first start with a simple extreme. This is an extreme case, just to give you some intuition. So let's think about the case when we have a very explicit class of functions that contains all the zero one functions over some domain. Okay, then in that case, if you think about it, any set of points can be labeled in all possible ways with functions from the class. And so this class is very expressive, and by definition, the VC dimension is infinite. And it better be infinite, why? Because we, we cannot hope to achieve generalization why? Because given any training set of points, uh, given any training set of examples, so it means points and labels, uh, there will always exist two functions in my class of functions, in this very expressive class of functions, say the blue, fun a blue function here and the kind of uh, um, uh, pink function there, right? So given any training set of points, I can only show two functions, but label the training set correctly in the exact same way, but they have completely opposite answers everywhere else. And of course, if this happens, I cannot hope to achieve any generalization because I have no idea which of them is a target function. Okay, so, because uh, this class of functions is too expressive. Okay, this is one extreme. Now, the very interesting fact, and this is a deep and I think a very cool and beautiful fact, is that if we're looking at classes of functions of finite VC dimension, suddenly such crazy behaviors cannot happen. And in particular, there is this, uh, uh, interesting result called the Sauer's lemma that says that if uh, the, uh, we have a class of functions of finite VC dimension D, then any set of points, um, or any, set, uh, any large enough set of points of size capital N strictly greater than D can be labeled only in a polynomial number of ways with functions from the class. So if the class was unrestricted, then the maximum, num uh, uh, the number, the maximum number of ways of labeling capital N point with functions from the class would be 2 to the N. But if the class of functions is finite VC dimension D, then suddenly this exponential number drops from two to the n to polynomial, n to the power of D. Okay, so that's kind of the, uh, uh, the, 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 the implication of having a finite class, of having a class of finite VC dimension D. For any large enough set of points, we cannot achieve too many labelings of those points with functions from the class. And then this turns out to be crucial in getting sample complexity results a uh, this one that I showed earlier that say that if the number of points you see in the training set is of the order VC dimension of H over epsilon squared, then that's sufficient to achieve epsilon uniform convergence, meaning to ensure that for all functions in the class, we have a high probability over the draw of the training set, uniformly for all such functions, we have that their empirical error is epsilon close to their true error. Okay, any questions or comments? Okay, and that actually, so this is really the key point that uh, when it implies this kind of having classes of finite VC dimension is sufficient for generalizability. Uh, but actually, I'm gonna spend two more minutes for those of you that happen to li like proofs to give you a little bit and even a deeper insight of why that's the case. Okay, but it's only two minutes, and then I'll move to uh, how do we use these tools in the context of mechanism design? Okay, but in case you are curious, like how do we go from Sauer's lemma to, to, to getting this interesting uniform convergence sample complexity that tells us that the, the, the number of samples to achieve uniform convergence depends only on the VC dimension, here is a high level insight about how this happens. Uh, uh, so the, the, there is, a, first of all, there is a very simple fact uh, of, that ha uh, of a very simple uniform convergence sample complexity result for classes of functions that are finite. Okay, and this can be easily proved by using really Hoeveding uh, uh, inequality together with union bounds, right? So you can show that if the class of functions H is finite, uh, uh, if we, in the training phase, we see one, roughly one over epsilon square log size of H plus log one over delta examples, then that's sufficient to guarantee that uniformly, with high probability at least some minus delta over the draw of the training set, we have it uniformly for all the functions in the class, their empirical error is within epsilon of their true error. 
Okay, that's a very basic, simple fact. And the way you prove it is just literally have the implant in your bound. So if you fix a function uh, h, and then you imagine drawing the, uh, the set of training examples, then you can argue that just by the Hoeffling inequality, you can bound the probability that a bad event happened where the, the true error of the function deviates by more than epsilon from the empirical error, and you can put a bound of that probability as a function of the number of training samples. Okay, this is for a fixed function when you want to get, you just do a union bound to then get a, an upper bound on the uh, probability that uh, the bad event where there exists a function in the class for which the bad event happens, uh, you can just start, do a union bound on the top and then to, you can bound the probability of the bad event overall by two times size of h times e to the minus two times n epsilon squared. You say that to be at most delta, the target probability of failure, and then you get this uh, sample complexity result. Okay, so when the case on the class of functions is finite, getting this uniform convergence result is pretty simple. Just have the inequality plus union bound. Now, in the case of, uh, this is only for finite uh, functions of classes. Now, how do we go from finite to infinite? Um, there is a very interesting result that is, uh, involves a couple of very cool tricks, um, uh, which is a symmetrization argument and a double sample argument. And it turns out that when the class of functions h is infinite, we can replace log size of h with log of the shattering coefficient. And what shattering coefficient at a level uh, 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 on n points is a maximum number of ways of splitting n points with the concept from the concept class. So it turns out there is a very interesting cool argument that, that shows that we can replace log size of h from the case when h is finite with log size of the shattering coefficient on uh, a level n in uh, this sample complexity result in the case when h is infinite. Okay, and now you can use this fact together with Sauer's lemma that tells us that uh, if we have, if the class of functions has finite VC dimension, then the shattering coefficient on n points is upper bounded by n to the VC dimension of the class of functions. And now these two facts, if you combine the two facts, turns out because uh, this is now, um, uh, the shattering coefficient here is upper bounded by n to the VC dimension, turns out that I, and, and I have the shattering coefficient in the log factor here, turns out that then I can solve for this inequality and I can come up with a sufficient condition on the number of samples for which this inequality holds and the sufficient condition is exactly the bound that I had earlier on the slide that tells me that if uh, the number of samples I see in the training phase is roughly this dimension of h over epsilon squared, then that's sufficient to guarantee, uh, say, epsilon uniform convergence. Okay, that's pretty much kind of the high level argument of why uh, uh, having a class of finite VC dimension is sufficient uh, for achieving uh, generalizability and with a concrete bounds on the number of samples that are sufficient for, for obtaining uniform convergence. Okay, so this is like a mini learning theory uh, course. Okay, now I can move on, uh, but this is, uh, so I want to move on from here to sample complexity of mechanism design. Okay, uh, and uh, when we do so, the very first thing you notice, well, this is a, these are only results for uh, classes of functions that are binary valued functions, but when we do mechanism design, we're trying to say maximize revenue, the corresponding class of functions are not binary valued, they are real valued classes of functions, right? And so what's the notion of dimension that I should be using there? Okay, there are multiple options. Um, uh, and one of them that, uh, we, uh, that has been used recently, including in our work with Thomas and Dylan, is uh, the pseudo dimension, uh, which is a natural analog of VC dimension to real valued function classes. So how many of you have seen pseudo dimension? Because most of you have seen VC dimension. Okay, good. So what pseudo dimension? Well, it's really just the natural analog of VC dimension to the case when we now have real valued function classes. Okay, and let me, uh, and I'll define it, and then I'll show you how to compute the pseudo dimension for interesting families of mechanisms. Okay, so what's the pseudo dimension? So, uh, the pseudo so now we have a function class f, it's a class of real valued functions, and what's the pseudo dimension of a function class f is just the cardinality of the largest set of points that can be, re can be shattered in a real valued sense with functions from my class. Okay, and what do I mean by this? The pseudo dimension of a, a class of functions f is just the cardinality of the largest set of points x1, x2, xn 
and thresholds y1, y2, yn, such that all two to the n above and below patterns can be achieved by functions in my function cluster. Okay, so for example, if n equals two, uh, uh, then what I need to, to show, uh, I need to show that there exists four functions, uh, f1, I need to show that there is a function f1 such that, uh, that achieves a below below pattern. That means f1 on the first point x1 should be strictly smaller than y, y1, and f1 on the point x2 should be strictly smaller than the point y2. This is a below below pattern. I also need to show that there is a function f2 such that f2 achieves the above below pattern, meaning f2 of x1 is strictly bigger than y1, and f2 of x2 is strictly smaller than y2. I also need to be able to show that I can achieve the, bel the below above pattern, meaning f3 of x1 is strictly more than y1, and f3 of x2 is strictly greater than y2. And finally, I also need the above above pattern, meaning uh, uh, there is a function f4, such that f4 of x1 is strictly bigger than y1, and f4 of x2 is strictly bigger, bigger than y2. Okay, so that's the pseudo-dimension. So the pseudo-dimension of a function class f of real valued functions is just the cardinality of the larger set of points that can be, uh, can be uh, shattered in a real valued uh, sense with functions from my class. So I can achieve an exponential, again, an exponential number of patterns on that set f. Okay, that's a pseudo-dimension. Uh, this is one definition of the pseudo-dimension. And now if we think about it, actually the pseudo-dimension of the function class f is actually just the VC dimension of a very uh, of, uh, an, uh, 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 of a related binary class of functions to my class f. So if I start with a class of functions f, I can define a class of functions the below the graph function class of functions, where for every function f in the original class I have this new function b uh, below the graph of the function f that now has an additional kind of coordinate for the y value, and when I define the value of the function to be on a point x y to be one if the point x, y is below the graph of, the, uh, of, uh, below the graph of, uh, below the graph of f, and I define that the value of that function to be zero otherwise, right? So basically, all the pseudo-dimension, if you think about the pseudo-dimension of a class of functions f, is just the VC dimension of a very related, uh, of the below the graph class of function corresponding to my original class of functions. Okay, so it's, very, it's really just a natural extension of VC dimension to binary values, uh, uh, the VC dimension to real value uh, classes of functions. So any questions? Okay, there are no questions. Uh, I guess I can uh, move on and show you one quick, another quick, just this is just a simple example, just to, uh, to get you to think more about real value shattering. So, for example, if we are considering affine, function on the re affine functions on the real line, you can show that the pseudo dimension of this class of functions is 2. Why? Because you can show, uh, 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 so first of all, you can show that there are two points, uh, uh, like these points here, x1 and x2, and there are two uh, that can be real, uh, shattered in a real value sense. Uh, so, there are these two points, x1 and x2, and these two threshold values y1 and y2, so that, uh, that then lead to all four, uh, uh, that, that for which you can get all four uh, uh, above below patterns, right? So for example, um, I, f1, I can show this, fun this function f1 here, this affine function f1, achieves the below below, the pa below below pattern respect to these points x1, x2, and these thresholds y1 and y2. The, functions, the function f2 here, this function here, achieves the above below pattern, for this point, the function f3 achieves the below above pattern, and the function f4 achieves the uh, above above pattern. Okay, and so uh, this is another example of kind of a shattering in a real value sense for my class of functions, for this specific class of affine functions. Okay, and because I mentioned, uh, uh, and by the way, when we do proofs for mechanism design, we're going to kind of use this shattering in a real value sense, but so I'm going slowly through it so that I make sure that you guys internalize the scheme. Okay. Now, uh, it turns out because I already mentioned that uh, this, uh, that the pseudo dimension is a natural extension of this dimension to real value functions, and I already mentioned that the pseudo dimension of a class of functions f is really just the 
uh, VC dimension of the of very related uh, class of functions, which is the below the graph class of functions for the original class. Because of it, and because I already uh, told you that VC dimension allows us to get uniform convergent sample complexity results, you shouldn't be surprised that now absolute dimension can be used as a measure of complexity to provide uniform convergence results for classes of real valued functions. Right? And indeed, there are results, uh, such sample complexity results. I have one of them on the slide. But I'm writing this result a little bit differently. So the results that I had earlier were more like PAC style results. Or, uh, so what I heard earlier on the slide, so saying this many samples suffice to get epsilon uniform convergence. This is what like people in kind of computational learning theory like to write. These are PAC style results. Now what I have here on the slide is more like a statistical style result where I kind of turn it around. They are very related. So now what I'm saying, uh, for any confidence parameter delta, uh, for any sample size n, I can guarantee that uh, with high probability at least some minus delta over the draw of the training set, I have this uniform convergence result that says that uniformly for all the functions in the class, I can show that um, uh, for any such function f in my class, I can show that the, uh, uh, the true expectation of the function is close to the empirical average over the training set. And how close it is? Well, the closeness depends on the pseudo dimension of the, uh, the class of functions and on the number of samples I've seen. And in particular, this closeness decays with the number of samples. And what's the decay rate is square of the pseudo dimension of the uh, class of functions over n, where it, capital N is the number of samples. Everybody's asking this question. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> Finally, the first question. It's uh, an upper bound on the function value. So when I had binary valued functions, you know, the upper bound on the function value was one. But in general, of course, kind of the, the range of the function class should appear in the sample complexity bound. And this is u here. It's an upper bound on the value of any function. Yeah? Great. Thank you. Yes? So if I have a function, how does the other How If I have a function class, if, if this is uh, the two dimensions for a function class, yeah. It's a great question. How do I figure it out? It's a great question. And well, uh, uh, you, you can prove results. Exactly, right? So this I prove to you. Like, this is dimensional linear separators in R2. I prove to you it's free. We can prove this dimensional linear separators in Rd is d plus 1. Right, if we have a new family of, if I'm thinking right now, say, go to context, to the mechanism design context, I might want to prove the pseudo dimension of, say, second price auctions of reserve prices, or the pseudo dimension of item pricing. How do I do that? I can prove theorems. But if I write down the function, then I can't figure out the truth, then I'm lost with the problem. It's a great question. I don't know, but I don't think there is an algorithm for computing it. In fact, it's probably hard. I would expect it. MP hard and pretty positive, and so on. It's much harder potentially. Now, um, and um, yeah, an upper bound would be good enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, yeah, what I want to get to is actually, okay, so I mean, in the worst, I mean, yeah, in general, you know, computing the pseudo dimension of a function class could be intractable algorithmically, of course. Now, um, uh, there are related, uh, it could still be intractable, okay, there are multiple aspects, could be intractable if I want to kind of do an algorithmic approach, could also be very loose, you know, because this is just an upper bound, it can be incredibly loose because it works, actually the strength, okay, so let me mention something that you mentioned, so which I think is really cool, you know, I'm taking it for granted in machine learning, but you know, uh, it's a very, uh, it might not be totally obvious for somebody who doesn't do machine learning. So actually, this theorem is really strong. So no matter what is the underlying distribution of these examples, this bound holds. So this bound is true for any underlying distribution of our uh, examples. So okay, that's a really strong bound. No matter what is the underlying distribution, I can get this uniform convergence result. But now, because it's so strong, it's also potentially weak because there could be certain distributions for which this bound here, this deviation, this upper bound on a deviation between uh, empirical expectation and true expectation could be really loose. And so you might ask, are there interesting bounds that you know, take into account the sensitivity of the distribution and moreover that potentially at least in principle computable? Maybe not necessarily for normal time, but at least in principle computable. And the answer is yes, there is something called Rademacher complexity that I'm not gonna talk about in my tutorial today, but I'm happy to tell you offline, there is another more modern measure of complexity kind of where you can put a bound that is data dependent potentially tighter, and at least in principle computable. But no, no, no it's a real valid. Yeah. Right, the market complexity is for real valid function classes. Actually, yeah. Okay, I'm more than happy to tell you offline about it. 
But for the remaining of the tutorial, uh, I'm going to stick with pseudo dimension because this is what I have on my next slide. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there are other interesting, actually that's interesting because there are, there are several other notions. There's something called scale sensitive dimension, graph dimension, there are many other notions. None of them was a natural extension, turns out. I mean, two dimensions natural, but none of them was maybe just the right extension. Actually, it turns out that after decades of working in learning theory, people realize that Rademacher complexity is the right notion you should be using, okay? Which, that literally just quantifies kind of how you can fit random noise with examples in your training set to just write it mathematically. How well can you correlate with random noise? Turns out that's the right notion of dimension. And it took people decades to figure that out. Great, so this is a quick tutorial of learning theory. Now let's see it in action in the context of auction design. Okay, so let's go and I'm gonna start with a simple, uh, uh, with a simple case of second price auctions reserve prices and I'm gonna show you a detailed proof of the pseudo dimension for this function class. And the very interesting fact is that this proof, it's a one slide proof, but has a very natural extension to a very general family of mechanisms that I'm gonna describe and then Ellen is gonna show us many examples that's much more broadly applicable. Okay, so this proof will be very instructive. Okay, so let's go back and think about second price auctions with reserve prices. This is what Ellen described in the, her first part of the, the tutorial. So here we'll just have one item for sale, we have multiple bidders, and how the auction works. Well, first the auctioneer sets the reserve price R, and then bidder submit bids, and then the highest bidder wins if its bid is uh, at least R, and then pays the maximum of the second highest bid and R. Okay, so that's a parameterized family of auctions with one, reserve, one parameter, which is the reserve price. So it's an infinite family of auctions, and it's only parameterized by one, thing, one parameter, the reserve price. And because of this, you know, normally in machine learning, it happens, it doesn't happen always in the context of mechanism design, but happens often in machine learning, if it's one parameter, the intrinsic complexity of the corresponding dimension will be constant. Okay, and it turns out that's the case here. We can show that the pseudo dimension of this uh, class of second price auctions, the reserve price is, is, act, is actually a constant, is uh, true. Okay, and in order to prove this fact, here is a key fact which kind of, uh, mathematically speaking, this is a, a fact about the structure of a, some sort of dual functions. And here is what the fact says. So if I fix a sample, that means I, fi I fix a, a, a set of uh, uh, bidder's values for the given item. So if I fix a sample, uh, and then if I vary the reserve price, then what I get is that the revenue function, as I vary the reserve price, is a piecewise linear function with three pieces. Okay, so it looks like this. Okay, and the proof of this fact is simple. So let's just fix a sample, that means a set of uh, buyer's values, uh, bids for the, uh, for the item. Okay, and let's assume, because that's fixed, now I can just, let's assume that the second highest bid fa falls here. Right, and let's reason how does the revenue function looks like as I vary the reserve price. Okay, well, when the reserve price is smaller than the second highest bid, then the highest bidder wins and pays the second highest bid. Right? This is why I get this segment here. Okay, now when the reserve price is in between the second highest bid and highest bid, then the, uh, the highest bidder still wins, but now pays the reserve price. This is why my function looks in this region as f of x equals x, the identity function. Now when the reserve price is bigger than the highest bid, then nobody wins anything and nobody pays anything, so the revenue gets to zero. Right, so I have now here, I have a sharp discontinuity. Okay, so again, what we've just shown is that if we have fixed a set of bids and then vary the reserve price, the revenue function is a piecewise linear function with three pieces. Okay, but this is only for one set of, for one sample. And now when we think about the, the pseudo dimension, we need to think about the behavior uh, of this mechanism class on many samples, right? So this is what I have to do next in order to analyze the pseudo dimension of my function class. Okay, and uh, this is what I'm gonna do right now, and I'm gonna try to prove that the pseudo dimension of my uh, family of uh, second price auctions or reserve price is at most true. How do I prove that? Well, uh, I already, uh, so using the picture from the previous slide, so if I have one sample, and if I vary the reserve price, then the revenue function is a piecewise linear function with three pieces. Right, this is a picture here. And now, uh, 
so this is for unfixed sample VI, which is a set of bias values for the given item. Okay, and now the, here is an interesting fact. So still for my fixed sample VI, if I fix a threshold, a revenue threshold YI, which I have to do when I think about, kind of when I start thinking about shattering, I need to think about uh, revenue thresholds. So if I fix uh, 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 some example VI, then I get this picture of the revenue function. And then if I fix a threshold YI, here's an interesting fact. As I scan the reserve price from zero to infinity, there are almost two cutoff values, in particular these two critical values here and here, where the revenue goes from being below the cutoff value to above the cutoff value and again below the cutoff value. Right, so if I have a sample and the revenue threshold, there are really two critical cutoff values here. Right? I go from below to above to below. This is for one sample, but again, when I compute pseudo dimensions, I have to think about the behaviors of many samples, on capital N samples. Now, if I have capital N samples, if I union the cutoff values, I'm gonna have two times N cutoff values. And the interesting fact is that for any reserve price in between any of these two cutoff values, I will have the same binary pattern above or below on all the samples. So basically what it means, I can achieve at most two times N plus one binary patterns on capital N samples with uh, auctions from this class. Okay, uh, this is an upper bound on how many binary patterns I can achieve real values, uh, how many uh, yeah, binary patterns I can achieve with functions uh, from this uh, mechanism class. But now recall that the pseudo dimension of a, a, a function class is just the maximum cardinality of the larger set of elements for which I can achieve exponential number of binary patterns, right? So in order to compute the pseudo dimension, what it means, all I need to do is to compute the cardinality of the larger set of n uh, uh, samples for which all two to the n binary patterns are achievable, but you know, I know that by using auctions that are simple, like second price auctions to reserve prices on any n samples, I can only achieve two times n plus one patterns, binary patterns. So to compute the pseudo dimension, all I have to do is to compute what's the largest n for which two to the n is upper bounded by two times n plus one. So all I have to do is to solve for this little inequality here. Okay, and when I do so, I get that the pseudo dimension is at most two. Okay, so it's small. And the implication then is that I don't need too many samples to achieve good generalizability. I only need actually one of epsilon square samples or constant of epsilon square samples to achieve uniform convergence, which is great. Okay? But this is just for the sake, the, so this is a proof, oh, actually, before going on to mention, so this is really a simple one slide proof of the fact that the pseudo dimension of second price auctions of reserve prices is at most two. Okay, and actually this result I want to mention that, so this is, the proof that we have here is from a paper that Ellen and Thomas and I had in EC last year. Uh, actually, but this result was not for the first time proved by us. It appeared in a paper by Mehri R. Murray and Andres Medina in ICML 2014. It also appeared in a paper by Jamie and team called 2016. So there were previous proofs of this fact, but they are much more complicated. This is a really simple proof. And the beauty of this simple proof is that now generalizes to many more interesting scenarios. Okay, and this is what I'm gonna state next. So it turns out that you can uh, extend this, uh, you can basically now generalize this result and uh, get a much more general theorem with an equally simple proof. And so here's the theorem. So now we'll be thinking about mechanism classes that are parameterized not only by one parameter, but by D real value parameters. So you can think about the parameter space as being R to the D. Okay, so that's the first assumption about the mechanism class. Now we also have a second assumption, which says about uh, a similar thing to what we had before, what we'll say is that if I fix a set of bias values, and if I vary the parameters uh, uh, P, what do I get? I get that the revenue function has a nice structure. In particular, if I fix a set of bias values and I vary the parameter P, I get that the revenue function is piecewise linear with not too many pieces. And what do I mean by not too many pieces? Well, there are mostly hyperplanes that lead to those pieces. Okay, so that's the second assumption I'm making about the mechanism class. So again, the first assumption is that just the mechanism class is parameterized by vectors in RT, by D real value parameters P, and the second assumption is that if I fix a set of bias values, there are mostly hyperplanes that partition RD, the parameter space in such a way that in each, in each cell of this partition, the revenue is linear. So in other words, the revenue function is piecewise linear, where the pieces are given by mostly hyperplanes, then you can show that the pseudo dimension of this class of mechanisms is not too large, and in particular is big O 
of d log dt, where d is a dimension of the parameter space, and these, again, the number of hyperplanes that uh, define each of these uh, kind of dual functions. Okay, so this, and so, for example, in the previous example that I had for second price auction, the reserve prices, I had three pieces and two hyperplanes that define the uh, kind of the revenue function. In general, you might have more hyperplanes that define the revenue functions than some more pieces and more dimensions, of course, like in this picture here. Okay, but the interesting fact is that in general, actually, so that's the interesting fact, actually, if the revenue function, the pseudo-dimension of the corresponding class of mechanism is actually not too large. It's only a little bit more than linear in D, where D is the dimension of the parameter space, and it's only logarithmic in the number of hyperplanes. So that's a really strong result, actually. Okay, and I'm not gonna go through the proof in details. Well, I want to kind of flash through like a few bullets to convince you that now the proof is very simple. Once you've seen the, uh, the, the, the proof for the, uh, for the second price auctions reserve price, once we have just the right proof for the second price auctions reserve price, we can generalize it to these more general scenarios. And basically what we have to do is to think about, well, if I have n samples, how many binary patterns uh, can I achieve? Uh, in how many ways can I shatter those samples in a real value sense? Well, if I have n samples, uh, in this corresponding dual function, I'm gonna have at most n times the hyperplanes. Now, if I have n times the hyperplanes in RD, how many regions can I obtain? And how many regions can I split RD with n times the hyperplanes? By using Sauer's lemma, kind of a dual class of functions, I can argue that it's at most n times t to the plus one to the d, roughly. So I can have at most n times t plus one to the d regions. Now, inside of the, each of the region, I guarantee that the revenue function is linear. That means that inside each of the regions, again, just doing some argument, I can argue that there are most n plus one to the d sign patterns. So if I can then put together the number of sign patterns I can achieve on capital N examples, turns out it's not too large, I just have to multiply these two numbers. It will be n times t plus one to the d times n plus one to the d. That's the number of sign patterns I can achieve on capital N examples. And then all I have to do is to remember that the pseudo dimension uh, is just the cardinality of the larger set n. That I can, for which I can achieve exponential number of sign patterns. So all I have to do is to solve for inequality of this form, you know, and then get the desired result. You know, so the proof really follows the structure of the second price auction reserve prices. So it's equally simple, but the final result is extremely general, which is very interesting. And then I'm going to show you, by the way, uh, uh, several cool applications in the context of mechanism design. Okay, and actually, uh, before talking about these applications, I want to mention actually that the, the, actually this proof is also kind of deep from a learning theory point of view. Okay, and here is why. Um, and uh, it's because we are trying to characterize the pseudo dimension of this family of mechanisms that are parameterized by this parameter vector P, for example, the reserve price for the second price auction, and we take as input uh, vectors of uh, buyer's values for the various subsets of the items, right? This is how our functions look like, our mechanisms look like, and we are trying to characterize the pseudo dimension of this family of mechanisms. That's our goal. But the interesting fact that in order to analyze the pseudo dimension of this family of mechanisms, what we exploit in our proof is a structure on the dual functions. And what are these dual functions? Now, the dual functions are now, parameter, uh, are now parameterized by, valuation, by buyer's values, by valuation vectors, and they take as input the various parameters. Okay, and so we now, in order to characterize the pseudo dimension of the original class of mechanisms, what we effectively do, we exploit the structure of these dual functions. And we exploit the fact that these dual functions are piecewise simple. Okay, and this is really the key insight in proving this theorem. And it turns out that similar insights we've been using to prove theorems in even more general contexts. We've been doing a lot of work on uh, automated algorithm design, and it turns out that similar ideas and insights can be really used there. And we've by now written some very, very general theorems. Okay, so I think it's also very interesting from a learning theory point of view, in addition to being, of course, very important to uh, automating mechanism design. Okay, and uh, I guess and I got, I'll stop here, and I'll just mention that you know, there are many interesting applications that Ellen will tell us about. Uh, I guess it should. Yeah, I'll just stop here and take any questions if there are any. So any questions or comments? Yes. 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 
Yeah, so I mean, when you ask this question, there are two questions you should be asking. The first question is, it's a sample complexity question. This is what I talked about today. Like when you do learning theory, you have to think about two questions. Sample complexity, if ignoring computational efficiency, statistically, do you generalize? Right, and that's exactly what I was telling, uh, talking about today. Actually, maybe I didn't say it explicitly. Actually, I didn't say it explicitly, thank you. So one thing I didn't say explicitly, in all of these mechanism classes that Ellen will talk about, including the second price auction reserve prices, the corresponding cost functions have sharp discontinuities. And indeed, learning theory traditionally doesn't look at such family of functions, families of functions. Actually, a lot of the families of functions in learning theory are seem to be smooth, to be, you know, to have, smooth. and so that's actually what I find really interesting, actually, that's why we had to develop new tools, actually, that's why we had to prove these new cool theorems to analyze these situations where the corresponding cost functions have sharp discontinuities. Okay, so it's a great question. So even from sample complexity point of view, uh, you know, we cannot totally port the results from learning theory. We can use insights from learning theory, and we can use the fact that the generalization depends on these notions of dimensions, but then analyzing these notions of dimensions require totally new insights. Okay, so that's the first thing. Now, of course, there is a second thing. Once we have sharp discontinuities, how do you optimize? How do we find the mechanism I'm hat? But that's nearly as well over the training set of samples. Of course, once we have sharp discontinuities, things become more uh, challenging. And then we got even more general too. Algorithms no, no, in general. Even more general than what Dina just showed. Right, right, right. Uh, right. So, so, so it, it may seem like magic when you see that there's this general result and all of a sudden it happens like right there. You guys can embrace the other way around. Yeah, and actually by the. Yeah, and we didn't tell you, but they before we had this EC18 paper, we had an IPS paper in 2016 that had a very convoluted argument for some of these results, and they're not the right arguments. Turns out that, like, the argument I showed today is the right argument that totally generalizes, because typically, once you have the right argument, you can generalize it. So thank you for the and comment. I, I'd like to thank also Dirk Bergman. Uh, when I talked to him over dinner about this, uh, and he said, okay, well, you know, it's, it's nice that you can apply by, by, by maximum, but we can apply the pricing Right, and so like two part, like two part tariffs, lot lotteries, and so on. Right, so we'll see more applications. Yeah, any more questions? There are some questions. Yeah. Uh, do you have any results for some of the leading Rademacher complexity? Uh, so we do have some Rademacher complexity results. You can put the Rademacher complexity. Your question: Do you have interesting upper bounds in the Rademacher complexity? I think for some of the mechanism classes, we analyze it. But I don't think at this point I have something like as general and as beautiful as this theorem for absolute dimension in this level. We do have, you know, right, the market complexity itself, you can put it down. It's, you just technically write down the, the, the ability of the class to fit random noise, you know, you, and so you can even, yeah, you can, yeah. So in principle, you can implement and, yeah, but it's not, uh, I, I would say we don't have, like, I think we had results in the paper that are using the right, the market complexity, but I don't think we had some, we don't have something like, uh, extremely as deep as this one. How about that? Okay, I have one more question. Can you, I know this is sort of out of scope, but can you contrast this approach a little bit with the data driven algorithm collection we talked about yesterday with the job? Oh, so that was uh, using similar ideas, you took similar ideas in the context, in very different contexts. So, like the, the, the talk is referring to us, we we're using data driven algorithm selection for clustering problem. You can do the same, you can again phrase the problem in a very similar way. You're trying to solve not only one clustering problem, but repeatedly solve clustering problems that come from a distribution. You're trying to select an algorithm for the family purpose problems. And you can ask similar questions. What's the two-dimensional, the corresponding family of algorithms, and so on. And so you can use similar ideas. Now, of course, to analyze absolute dimension, you actually have to look at the structure, the family of algorithms at hand, and that's what we've been doing with the line of work, right? Because even here, right, for example, with all these general theorem here, but you know, you have to show but for mechanism design. Many interesting mechanism classes satisfy these, the conditions of this theorem, right? So then it becomes a little bit more specific to the problem setting. Yeah, there are more questions? Yeah. Sorry, just to the end, but there is still no assumption of distribution. Yeah, so that's the beauty of this results, yeah. But I'm assuming the samples are ID, though. Yeah. 
it's absolutely general, right? That's how learning pure results, how statistical learning pure results go by, and so that's the strength of those results. But yeah, but as I mentioned, I do agree, it's really cool. But as I mentioned, yeah, definitely, it's very cool. How about it? <laughs> I was about to say it's cool, it's, it's a strength, but as I mentioned earlier, it could also be a weakness because the bounds based loops dimension are still kind of loose, right? So you can hope to tighten them by using data dependent bounds that are the market complexity. Yeah? But still, of course, very, very cool that it works for any distribution. We have some rather macro complexity in the paper, yeah. There are also any more, any more questions? Yeah. This is basically about how large, how large of a sample we need. Yeah. Uh, yeah, which is the first question in learning theory, because if you don't generalize, yeah. why should you work hard to get an algorithm? But you also have to think, yeah. Exactly. But it also should be applied to everything. It should be. I think it's exactly what he was mentioning. I, we have, I have a line of work, and actually, Ellen works on that as well, and Thomas. We have a line of work where we apply it beyond mechanism design. We're looking at how to, how, to, how to learn clustering algorithms, how to learn how to branch, if you're doing branch and bounds, how to learn how to round semi definite programs. You can apply it everywhere in games. Kind of the same idea. Yes, although in the standard task classification regression, there are already results, right? So like, we already know, like, these results, I mean, in the context of classification and regression, there are results, like a classification from the 70s, Dabnik and Chervenenkis, right? So I mean, like, classic machine learning, this is a little bit different from classic machine learning, and again, it's different because we're looking at problems where we often have combinatorial outputs, and also where, because all these cost functions have sharp discontinuities, so sudden, because the mechanisms are modular, like AMA and so on, and so you have sharp discontinuities, and that's why the structure is very different from classic machine learning. But of course, there is classic machine learning. We know how to do classification and regression. But this is going to the next level. We are learning, basically, we are learning more interesting objects. We are learning a mechanism which is more complex than a simple classifier. Yeah, it depends on the number of parameters, how it depends, uh, really depends on the structure of the mechanism class. So, you know, because we, uh, we are not, uh, for the second price auction, reserve price turned out to be identical to the number of parameters, but we have results where it's not identical to the number of parameters. Surprises happen because these cost functions are, uh, they have sharp discontinuities. So you, we actually have, uh, in, a, in related work, like for example, for clustering problems, you can have a class of algorithms that is parameterized by one parameter, but the two dimension is not constant. And it's again because you have sharp discontinuities. So, I would, the way I think about it, this is really an interesting extension to learning theory to, more in, to the case where I'm learning much more interesting objects like mechanisms, so mechanism design, algorithms in general. And so basically, you have to develop new tools. Take learning theory to the next level. Great. I guess. No more comments. We can stop here with my part of the talk. Okay. Um, so, like Nina said, I'm going to be giving a few applications of this theorem, and then I'm going to move on to other works. Okay. So, I'm going to start off with posted price mechanisms, which we've talked about a few times throughout this tutor tutorial. So, here there are multiple items and multiple buyers. Uh, the mechanism designer gets to set a price per item, and there is some arbitrary ordering over the buyers. The first buyer arrives, and they buy the bundle of items that maximizes their utility. Then the next buyer arrives, buys the bundle of remaining items that maximizes their utility, and so on. And these have been studied extensively in EconCS, and we see them every day. So what we prove is um, a pseudo-dimension bound on the number uh, on this class of mechanisms. And so like we saw in the part Nina presented, the pseudo-dimension of this class is d log dt, where d is the number of dimensions of the parameter space of this class, and t is the number of hyperplanes splitting the parameter space into these piecewise linear uh, pieces. Okay. So the number of dimensions of this class is clearly the number of items. We have the number of item parameters, right? Because we get to set a price per item. So that's how many parameters there are. And the number of hyperplanes splitting this parameter space into piecewise linear regions 
We prove it's the number of buyers times 2 to the number of items choose 2. Okay, and I'm going to give a proof sketch for this. So fix a set of buyer's values. For every buyer and for every pair of bundles, it's pretty easy to see if you just write it out that there's going to be a hyperplane in the price space that defines where the buyer prefers one of these bundles over the other. So that means we're going to have t many hyperplanes over which all of the buyer's preference to orderings are fixed, where t, again, is the number of buyers times the number of pairs of bundles, which is 2 to the number of items choose 2. Once all of the buyer's preference orderings are fixed, the bundles they buy are fixed too. So if we zoom in on any one region of the price space where uh, these defined by these hyperplanes, the bundles they buy are going to be fixed within that set of prices. So that means that revenue is going to be a linear function of those bundles that they buy in that region of the price space. So that's how we get this result. We've set, uh, we fix a set of buyer's values, and we look at how many hyperplanes are there splitting the parameter space into regions where revenue is linear. And a corollary of this result is that the pseudo-dimension of this class is the number of items squared. And this result was also shown by Morgan Stern and Roughgarden in their Colt 16 paper. So now I'm going to show. Yeah. <laughs> and now I'm going to show two, um, two other mechanism classes that, that weren't, weren't studied before, before our theorem. So the first is a uh, two-part tariff. So here there's a single item, but there are multiple units of this item for sale. The seller sets an upfront fee, PO, and a fee per unit. So if a buyer chooses to buy K units, they pay a price of PO, that upfront fee, plus of the fee per unit for however many units they buy. And these are also very common in the real world. So for example, if you sign up for a gym, you're going to have to pay some membership fee plus a fee per month. And also, like Keurig machines and espresso machines also follow this pattern, because you have to buy the machine, and then you have a price per pod. So yeah, the buyer is going to buy the number of units that maximizes their utility. And to get more revenue, the seller can also offer a menu of tariffs, L many tariffs. And the buyer is going to choose the number of tariffs and the, the is going to choose the tariff and the number of units that maximizes their utility. And these have also been studied a lot, especially in economics. Yep. Um, no, that can also vary over the menu. So here we show, again, the pseudo-dimension of this class is d log dt, as we've seen before. This time, the number of dimensions is two times the number of uh, tariffs in this menu. And t is the, the number of hyperplanes, which is the number of buyers times l times the number of units for sale, choose two. And these actually might start to look familiar from the previous proof. So uh, the number of dimensions, well, we get to set an upfront fee and a price per unit for every lottery, so it's going to be 2 times L. And then the number of hyperplanes, so for every buyer and every pair of both the tariff and the number of units they choose to buy, there's going to be a hyperplane defining the space or the, the prices where the buyer prefers one tuple over the other. OK, so then there are going to be t hyperplanes defining where the preference orderings are fixed, where t is the number of buyers, times the number of these tuples, these pairs of tuples. And then once the buyer's preference orderings over these tariffs and the number of units they buy is fixed, the, um, the, 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 uh, so once their preference ordering is fixed, the tariffs and the number of units they buy is fixed. And so then again, revenue is going to be a linear function of both the upfront fee and the price per unit. So it uh, follows a really similar structure from the previous proof. And here we get that the pseudo dimension and a corollary is that is the number of tariffs in this menu. Okay, and one more um, one more application, which are randomized mechanisms or lotteries. So here, let's think about a multi-item lottery where there's one additive bidder. 
So this lottery is going to be a present, uh, represented by a set of probabilities, one per item, and a price. If the buyer chooses to buy the lottery, they're going to pay a price of p, and they're going to buy each item i with probability phi i. Phi i. So their expected utility is going to be summing over all of the items, what's their value for the item, times the probability they get that item, minus p. And again, you can offer a menu of lotteries, L many of them, that the buyer can choose from. And the buyer is going to choose their expected utility maximizing lottery, or buy nothing. And these also have been studied very extensively in EconCS. OK, and, um, and so our, what we prove here, pseudo dimension again, is d log dt, where t, the number of hyperplanes splitting the parameter space into linear regions, is L squared, the number of lotteries squared on this menu. And the number of dimensions in the parameter space is basically the number of items times the number of lotteries. And the proof sketch is, again, really similar. You think, where would they prefer one lottery over the other? Um, and so our uh, corollary is that the pseudo dimension of this class is the number of lotteries times the number of items. And um, I'm not going to give the uh, proof, exact proof sketch for these, but we also study affine maximizer auctions, uh, which Tuomas mentioned in his part of the talk. And the, if you remember, these are really complicated classes of mechanisms. You've got a boost that you add to every allocation. And that, that complexity is reflected in the pseudo-dimension bounds. And in fact, we, in our um, NERFS 16 paper, we have lower bounds saying you really can't do much better than this. But uh, the kind of the good news is that there are these even si there are these simpler classes of affine maximizer auctions, which we do get good pseudo dimension bounds for. So these include mixed bundling auctions with reserves and mixed bundling auctions, which Thomas also mentioned briefly in his section of the talk. And we also study other mechanism classes that I'm not going to go into here, but other nonlinear pricing mechanisms and also what are called lambda auctions. So um, something you might have noticed when hearing about these affine maximizer auctions is that you could imagine kind of finely grained hierarchies splitting up these classes of affine maximizer auctions. So for example, so just to, to remind you with these affine maximizer auctions, basically you run a weighted version of the VCG mechanism where you multiplicatively boost all of the bidder's bids and you add a little bit of uh, uh, you add a little boost to some of the allocations. So you could imagine enforcing a constraint, a kind of a sparsity constraint, saying that I'm only going to boost at most k of the allocations. I'm only going to give at most k allocations a non-zero boost. So we're going to get this kind of finely grained hierarchy of affine maximizer auctions. And you can actually immediately imply our, uh, apply our general theorem to see that the empirical revenue of any k-sparse AMA is going to be close to its expected revenue, where the difference is actually depends on the sparsity level. So that's just a, um, a direct application of our general theorem. And you can also imagine other hierarchies of affine maximizer options, such as only boost allocations in some carefully chosen set of allocations. Maybe you have some prior knowledge telling you that those are good allocations to boost to increase competition. And again, we see this class of this set of allocations reflected in the pseudo dimension bound. So as we increase k, for example, the sparsity, lip, the sparsity level, we're going to get worse and worse generalization guarantees. Because the class of mechanisms is getting more and more complex. But as we look at more and more complex mechanism classes, we also get a higher and higher chance that we're going to find a mechanism class that contains a high revenue auction. So inevitably, there's this trade-off between revenue and generalization. So in this um, EC18 paper, we provide guarantees for optimizing this trade-off between revenue and generalization. So just to give you an example, let's think about that class of k-sparse AMAs where you only allow to boost at most k allocations at a time. So
So we prove that if m hat is the mechanism that maximizes overall sparsity levels and all k-sparse AMAs, its empirical revenue minus this kind of complexity dependent term, then if k star is the optimal AMA sparsity level, the, me the revenue of this mechanism m hat is going to be close to the optimal AMA uh, revenue, where how close it is actually only depends on the sparsity level of the optimal AMA. So this m hat, basically we're finding the kind of sweet spot between revenue and generalization, because this empirical revenue is going to increase as we increase the sparsity level, but uh, this complexity dependent term is going to decrease as we increase the sparsity level. So yeah, yep, yep. Yeah, yeah. So that was the, what I was going to mention. Is that yeah, you can also work out the constants. So then you can actually do this optimization. We have that in the paper. Yeah, yeah, we have it in the paper. Yep. Yeah. And you could also imagine doing the same thing with other kinds of hierarchies of affine maximizer. So uh, um, a bit more generally, we say that this, we call this structural revenue maximization, where our goal is to optimize this trade-off between empirical revenue and keeping the class simple. And this idea of structural revenue maximization is based on a long line of work in machine learning on structural risk minimization. Great. So now I want to um, move on uh, from the EC18 paper to, to other kind of AMD algorithms and um, other papers in this space. The first I want to talk about is empirical Meyerson. And you can think of, in the interest of time, since uh, it's getting close to dinner, I'm going to, you can think of these as kind of like um, advertisements for talk talks that you can see at FCRC this week. So the first is empirical Meyerson auction. Um, so this idea has been around for a while, starting with work by Elkind in 2007. Um, and so if you remember Meyerson's optimal auction, which we saw at the beginning of this tutorial, you had to know the distribution from which the buyer's values were drawn to run Meyerson's auction. So what if we only had samples from this distribution? Maybe we can define some kind of like empirical distribution and run Meyerson's auction on that empirical distribution. This is kind of like the flavor of these approaches. And I'm just going to give you like a really high level idea of basically what I just said. So this is the high level idea of um, this empirical Meyerson auction. So you draw the samples, and then somehow, and like there are various ways to do this, you formulate an empirical distribution using these samples. And then you, what you, auction you end up using is basically Meyerson's auction return, uh, defined over this empirical distribution. And there have been a bunch of works that have thought about this. And the most recent one is in Stock 19. Um, and it's, you can see the talk tomorrow at 4 PM. And this talk, or this paper, provides tight sample complexity guarantees for this single item revenue maximization setting. Uh, and, and so it's called set, settling the sample complexity of the single parameter revenue maximization. Um, so, yeah, I, I think this, talk, uh, this paper is, really, is uh, really nice, so I recommend going to the talk tomorrow. And there have been also a lot of other works on other aspects of single item um, mechanism design uh, from samples. So looking at, for example, non-truthful auctions, lower bounds on, um, on sample complexity guarantees, looking at kind of like new takes on classic statistical theorems to get uh, sample complexity guarantees, learning from only a constant number of samples. So here we've been assuming you can like sample a polynomial number of samples from this distribution. But what if you can only sample a constant number of samples? Can you still get good revenue? And then also looking at ad auction design from this kind of sample-based approach. OK. And the next paper I want to talk about is um, up to epsilon multi-item revenue maximization. So here we're in a setting where there are multiple additive bidders who have independent item values bounded between 0 and 1. So what uh, Goncharovsky and Weinberg show is that um, 
you'll only need polynomial and the number of items, or the number of bidders, the number of items, and basically some um, parameters, some confidence and uh, estimation parameters. Only this many samples are sufficient to learn with probability one minus delta, an approximately incentive compatible auction, which has revenue within epsilon of optimal. And so unlike, um, unlike the sample complexity guarantees that Nina was talking about, this, this sample complexity guarantee is, is tied to an algorithm, which is not computationally efficient um, for now. But uh, it, so this is more of an information theoretic sample complexity bound. So if you had an algorithm that had un unbounded running time, then you could get this very, very good sample complexity guarantee. You only need polynomially number of samples to learn a nearly optimal auction. Yeah, nearly optimal overall in the like, whole world of all mechanisms, as opposed to competing with some fixed class of mechanisms. And this also applies to more general evaluation settings satisfying certain Lipschitz conditions. So these, uh, these valuations can uh, exhibit complementarities. And Yanai Goncharovsky is uh, giving a talk on this this Friday um, at the EC Informs workshop, even though this appeared in Fox EC. So um, yeah, cool. And then so the um, one more paper I wanted to talk about um, is a new paper um, in EC19, which is uh, estimating approximate incentive compatibility. Okay, so um, we've seen that uh, incentive compatibility is a fundamental concept in mechanism design. And as, we, as we've seen, it means that the bidders maximize their utility if they bid truthfully. But many mechanisms in the real world are not incentive compatible. So for example, discriminatory auctions are used to sell US Treasury bills and also UK electricity, but they're not incentive compatible. Uh, many major display ad exchanges are moving towards the first price auction, which is also used in many other places in the world. And that's, of course, not incentive compatible. And also the generalized second price auction um, is used to sell sponsored search ads, of course, but it's not incentive compatible. And even most fielded combinatorial auctions are not incentive compatible. So why aren't, why aren't these mechanisms incentive compatible? There's, uh, why don't we use incentive compatible mechanism always? And there's a lot of reasons for this. So for example, it might be expensive for bidders to have to compute their true values for like every single bundle of items. Oftentimes the rules are easier to explain of these non-incentive compatible mechanisms for whatever reason. Sometimes, for example, in um, ad auctions, the bids are used to tune parameters of future auctions, so these, these auctions are no longer incentive compatible. Mechanisms might leak the bidder's private values, so they have no incentive to actually uh, reveal these, these values. And finally, maybe the agents aren't risk neutral. So under a mechanism that's incentive compatible when the agents are risk neutral, it's no longer incentive compatible. Okay, so there have been these like other notions of incentive compatibility that people have thought of, like relaxations of incentive compatibility. And what I'm going to talk about is X interim gamma incentive compatibility, which means that for each bidder I, so long as everyone except bidder I behaves truthfully, bidder I can only increase her utility by gamma if she bids strategically. And this is an expectation over the other's values. And I'll actually write what this means mathematically in a couple slides. But I wanted to mention that this has been studied by a lot of different people, this, this type of approximate incentive compatibility. So um, in, in this uh, EC19 paper, our, our goal is to approximate incentive compatibility using samples. So the first thing you might try is to bound the maximum utility this agent can bid, uh, can gain by misreporting her type on average over samples drawn from this distribution. And so mathematically what this means is look at all possible values uh, the agents might have and the possible reported types they might report and look on, on average what is the utility they would gain from bidding strategically 
minus the utility they would have if they just bid truthfully. We can use uniform, the uniform convergence guarantees that Nina gave to show that this equation one converges to the expected utility that agent can gain by misreporting her type. OK, so that's just written here. In maximum over all values, the expect, uh, an expectation over everyone else's values, the utility an agent can gain by misreporting her type. But there might not be a finite time procedure for actually doing this maximization problem. So instead, what we're going to try to do is see how much, can the, um, how much utility can an agent gain by misreporting her type on average over the samples if her true and reported types are from some finite subset of the type space. And I want to mention that this estimate has been used in deep, uh, mechanism design for deep learning. And we don't study like deep learning in this paper, but it's definitely an estimate that has existed already. Um, and basically, what these uh, mechanism designed by deep learning papers do is add a constraint requiring that this estimate be small. So the challenge here is that the, um, we might miss pairs of true and reported types that have very large utility gains when we're only searching over a finite subset of the type space. So how do we deal with this? So in particular, what, um, we have two questions to answer. Which finite subset and what is our estimates error? And that's what I'm going to mention in a little more detail here. So in particular, this is the equation I showed before. So we're saying in max, maximize over all possible types of the agent and all misreported types, what, um, what is the utility they could gain on average over the samples by bidding, um, misreporting their type? So that was on, over the entire type space. But we're saying, look only at a finite subset of the type space. How much utility can they gain? And then the, the question we need to answer is, what's the difference between equation one and equation two? How much, are we, how, how much do we lose by searching only over a finite subset of the type space? OK, but, um, so let's talk about which finite subset first. Uh, before we answer that estimation error question. We're going to talk about um, the uniform grid. And we also look at uh, other types of covers, but let's talk about the uniform grid here. It's very easy to construct, but it will only work when the distribution over buyer's values is nice, as I'm going to quantify next. But uh, so let's talk about why the, utility, the uniform grid would, could be challenging to optimize over. And the reason is that utility functions are volatile, as Nina alluded to in her part. So if you think about the first price auction, for example, think about fixing a buyer's value and varying their bid. And what does their utility function look like? If we fix the other bidder's bids, there's going to be this drop where while my bid is smaller than the other bidder's bid, I'm not going to get it. But as soon as I have a bid higher than um, the other's bidder's bids, I'm going to win it, and my, my utility is going to drop with my bid, because it's the first price auction. And so utility functions are especially volatile over samples, because these samples might be very concentrated. So when we take the average of the utility functions, there might be a lot of discontinuities. And thus, we might miss these portions of um, the parameter space where we could gain a lot by misreporting our type. So when is the distribution nice enough that we can use this uniform grid? So we, we, we quantify the niceness of a distribution using this notion of dispersion, which was introduced by me and, um, me and Nina and also a, another student, Travis Dix, in 2018. So we say that a set of utility functions in this work are WK dispersed if every W ball contains at most K of the discontinuities. So we're just saying that the discontinuities are not too concentrated in any space. As you can see in this picture, like it, they're not going to be dispersed if there are lots of discontinuities in any one region. But they are going to be dispersed, specifically if every W ball contains at most K discontinuities of the functions. So this is the main tool we use to prove 
um, our approximate incentive compatibility guarantee. And in particular, we proved that first, if the bidders are independent, so th their, their values, a single bidder's values might be correlated, but the bidders are independent. Um, the ut and the utility functions induced by the n samples at a high level are WK dispersed and piecewise ellipsis. Then we can use the W grid as our finite subset of the type space that we search over. And our estimation error is only going to be LW plus K over N plus square root of D over N, where um, D is basically the utility function pseudo dimension. So this is going to be a good bound when W is basically square root of the 1 over square root of the number of samples, and K is about the square root of the number of samples. Because then we're going to get our, that our estimation error is going to go to um, zero as the number of samples grows. So we'll be able to estimate this approximate incentive compatibility guarantee. And we prove these WK values hold when the distribution is nice. So um, just to give a couple quick applications um, before I wrap up. So when does this dispersion hold? When can we give these good in incentive compatibility guarantees? So let's say that the range of the density functions defining the agent's type distributions are bounded within zero to kappa, which basically means there's no like point mass. Under the first price auction, we show that we can estimate this X interim incentive compatibility approximation guarantee um, up to an estimation error, which is basically the number of bidders plus one over kappa, where kappa is our range, divided by the number of square root of the number of samples. We also analyze combinatorial first price auctions. And for the generalized second price auction, we show a similar guarantee, but the dependence on the number of bidders is a little higher. And finally, we also study discriminatory uniform price auctions, which are generalizations of the first price auction, and get a guarantee here that depends on the number of units for sale. Okay, so um, now I'm just going to wrap up uh, with mentioning this has been this, so this. Tutorial has been mostly talking about the um, batch learning for auction design, but I want to mention that, uh, that there's been a ton of work in other aspects of learning for mechanism design, which uh, we haven't had the time to talk about here. But I want to at least mention them before we wrap up. And the f probably the biggest of these lines of work is online learning, where here uh, there's some set of items for sale. So let's say that there's a coffee for sale. And on the first day, you are the seller. You set a price for, of $3. And you see, is, was the item sold or was it not sold? And let's say it was sold. So on the next day, you increase the price. And it wasn't, this coffee was not sold. Um, on the next day, you decrease this price, still wasn't sold, and so on. And the goal in this online learning setup, as, um, as is typical in online learning, is to minimize regret. We want to set the prices so that we minimize regret, where regret is the cumulative revenue of the best price in hindsight that we could have chosen, minus the cumulative revenue of the prices that we actually chose. Uh, so there have been a lot of works looking at regret bounds for learning nearly optimal auctions. Um, and here there's like the same set of items as sell day after day. Uh, and um, we want to compete with the best mechanism in hindsight. And there's a lot of different variations on this general theme. So for example, you can think about what if the buyer's value, the buyers are adversarial versus stochastic. Maybe their values are stochastic. Maybe the buyers behave truthfully or myopically day after day. Or maybe they behave strategically, trying to optimize their utility in the future by bidding a specific way in the present. And this is only a, sample, a small sample of the work in this, this area. Um, related to this kind of regret minimization is also profit inequalities and secretary problems, where here, this time there's a fixed set of items that we want to sell. And in the profit inequalities um, setting, the buyers are going to arrive in adversarial order, but they're going to have random valuations. Whereas in the secretary problem, the buyers arrive in a random order, but they have adversarial valuations. Um, and uh, another related line of work uh, is learning to bid. 
So you can think about like um, this in the context of an ad auction. In this learning to bid literature, at the beginning of the learning procedure, the buyer knows nothing about their own value for the items. So for example, like in ad auctions, you could imagine you just don't know if you, um, if you were to buy an ad slot, like would, would buyers click on it and how often would they click on it? So you don't really know your own value for the item you're, you want to buy. And then at each round, the buyers learn the values for the items that they actually win. And the goal in this line of work is to compete with the best fixed bids in hindsight. So you're learning to bid. OK, and um, the, last, uh, the last learning setup that I want to talk about is learning from revealed preferences. So here, let's say that we have two basically divisible items for sale, gold and diamonds. And on every day, we, set, we choose a, a price to set for these items. So let's say we uh, set a price of $9 for the gold and uh, $8 per pound for the diamonds. And on the first day, we see that uh, one pound of gold was bought and zero pounds of diamonds were bought. And then we change the prices, and we see how were the quantities bought changed and, and so on. And after observing these revealed preferences, the question is, if we were to set a specific prices, like $6 for gold, $4 per pound of diamonds, what, how much would the buyers pay? So this is, um, in these works, uh, the people have, tra uh, the, uh, people have uh, formulated this as a batch learning problem, where you think about this set of revealed preferences of the buyers as a training set. And then we want to be able to learn on a new training, on a new example, or on new prices, what will the buyers buy. So this line of work has investigated these natural questions, like how, how large should this training set be? And then algorithmically, how do we actually learn this preference function of this buyer we're interacting with? OK, and so now I'm just going to wrap up with some future directions. And the first of which is uh, naturally, we, we want better optimization algorithms for automated mechanism design. So um, in particular, one specific example of a type of algorithm it would be nice to have is better algorithms for structural revenue maximization. So um, a, a few slides ago, I mentioned that we gave guarantees for structural revenue maximization. But actually optimizing over a hierarchy of mechanisms can be very computationally challenging. This has been challenging for learning theorists for decades as they've been studying structural risk minimization. So the, um, it would be nice to actually be able to optimize over a nested hierarchy. Uh, another, another open question which Nina alluded to is better beyond worst case sample complexity bounds or in other words, bounds that adapt to the niceness of the underlying distributions. And for example, this might use tools like Rademacher complexity or like covering style analyses, um, which have been looked at a, a little bit in prior work, but I think there's still like a lot of interesting questions in this area. Um, we'd also like to look at other um, objectives beyond revenue maximization, which Thomas did mention uh, a few in his slides, but uh, there's a, there are a lot of other uh, ways we could look at this. And then other applications of automated mechanism design beyond selling. So with that, thank you very much. And we'll take any more questions you might have. Oh, I have a talk on, on Thursday. That wouldn't work. On the approximate incentive compatibility. What time? Um, maybe four or something like that. <laughs> 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 I have no idea. <laughs> OK, thank you. Thank you so much for your attention. And you can come ask us questions if you want.